Greetings, brothers and sisters. I'm Professor Spira, and today I'd like to talk about the history of forced sterilization in the United States of America and what we need to know today. This is a very timely topic, as you will see. Right now, we are in the midst of hysteria surrounding the so-called coronavirus, COVID-19, and there are so many different discussions going on. People's lives are being upended. They're not allowed to work. Today, in the state that I live in of Ohio, the governor issued a uh, an order saying that all everybody needs to stay in their homes. We're not supposed to go out and uh, unless we go to the store or have an emergency or something. We're supposed to stay in our homes, practice so-called social distancing, and so. We have to start to have a discussion or continue to have a discussion, have a more serious discussion about government power and how that affects us, especially those of us in the holistic health field, the field of trying to uh, educate people about healing themselves and what this all could mean for us, and what can we do about it. So I'm not just going to go on here and talk for however long this discussion is. Uh, at the end, we're going to put something together where we can come together and have a realistic and much-needed discussion about what we do to protect ourselves. I'm a firm believer of looking and analyzing studying the past look at the history so much of the worst of the worst has already happened if we are going to prevent it from happening again or prevent something even worse from happening we have to take a look at the history unfortunately so many of us have went if we went to public schools or even private education systems we have been given a very sterilized look at the past, at the history, at history. Uh, and so that's something that we have to take responsibility for in doing the additional research, do, taking the time to, uh, to educate ourselves Again, so education with a purpose, not just so you can go on Jeopardy and say, uh, you know, I'll take sterilization for 50, Alex. Like, no, this is a this can allow us to come together and put together a plan that will take that will protect us and take us into the uh, the next phase of human existence. So let's get going here. So overall, first I'm going to define and discuss what forced sterilization is. We'll talk a little bit about some of the historical details and examine relevance for today. Of course, this stuff is still happening uh, in various countries. It happens very regularly. It still happens in the United States of America, but people don't uh, uh, often know about it. So we're going to look at that and then at the end, like I said, talk a little bit about what can we actually do with this information once we have been educated? What's the next step? We will talk about that. So a couple different definitions of sterilization. If you look it up, of course, the process of making something free from bacteria. More relevant to our discussion today is sterilization as a surgery to make a person or animal unable to produce offspring. So forced or coerced sterilization in the United States of America. Federally funded and enforced sterilization policies and programs took place in 32 U.S. states throughout the 20th century. And in some of the legislation, the words such as unwilling and unwitting people, it was written into the law that it was okay to forcibly take the ability for somebody to produce offspring away from them. The government comes in, forcibly takes, I mean, just, just think about that for a second. I mean, we're, we're using these words, sterilization, and even that, it pulls you out of 
what is actually taking place here. You know, in some previous videos where I talk about the coronavirus and some of in vaccinations and things like that, uh, I use the term, what do you do when somebody shows up with a gun in one hand and a syringe in the other? What do you do? Now, even though that sounds as if to a lot of people that have enjoyed a certain level of safety within their current current situation, it's hard for them to imagine that the gut that something like that could happen, that the government come in or government agencies or whatever can come in and and do something so horrid. But the problem is it since it doesn't happen to enough people to really get everyone's attention or there would be an outrage about it. It happens to marginalize people, people that society has uh, ostracized or thrown away, then it is easily ignored. Most significantly from 1907 to 1962, uh, over 64,000 people were uh, forcibly sterilized in, in the United States. Of course, these are the general statistics. I tend to want to take closer look at these kinds of things. You Sometimes these statistics are uh, underrepresent uh, actual numbers, but this is sort of the general consensus. So this was a uh, used as a means to control undesired populations or undesirable populations. Uh, often immigrants, people of color, poor people, unmarried mothers, the disabled and mentally ill people were often the victims of this horrendous uh, legitimate policy. Every time somebody says, well, it's the law, these law abiding citizen mentality of folks that say, well, it's the law. Uh, this was the law. Does that make it okay? Did that make it okay? Is it justice? I want to know if something is just. I don't care what the law is if it's unjust. Just and justice and real justice, real ethics, is always will trump the so-called law when the law is uh, something so hideous. And uh, there's a quote that I'll read out of a, this was uh, posted on uh, hrw.org. A sterilization is an irreversible medical procedure with profound physical and psychological effects. Uh, forced sterilization is an act of violence, a form of social control, and a violation of the right to be free from torture and other cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment very uh some awful stuff let's take a look found these images of eugenic and health exhibit and uh, we'll define and talk about the eugenics the concept of eugenics in a moment but i just wanted to show you this to to get an idea so that there was this in some states this traveling presentation they would travel from city to city all these, these small town folk travel from place to place and essentially espouse a racist and hate-fueled psychology and paradigm to these thousands, potentially millions of people. And uh, here's a good, uh, good picture. Uh, I'm not sure if you uh, can see it there. But here's, here's a good picture, eugenic health exhibit. And you see all these these people here that are uh, that are just sitting and waiting to uh, see what the speaker has to say, the American Eugenics Society. And so uh, just to give a bit of perspective here, and uh, I will recommend and put a link to this article on uh, Our Bodies, Ourselves, History of Forced Sterilization and Current U.S. Abuses. Uh, it's a good article. Of course, a lot of people will just Google for sterilization, and you can always look at the Wikipedia articles and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes those things are a bit compromised. But this is 
a uh, pretty well-written article that also gives a bit of perspective, not too long, doesn't get into a lot of uh, academic words or anything like that. So it's something that I recommend checking out. I'd like to take a couple minutes and watch some clips from a video called uh, The Killing Nurses of the Third Reich. The basis for Hitler's plan of racial hygiene was a concept called eugenics, which is the pseudoscience of developing a superior race. Before Hitler came to power across the world, the whole theory of eugenics was something that many nations had embraced. This theory of eugenics, how people should be allowed to breed to the benefit of the human race and those who, who weren't fit and healthy should not be allowed to have children. And the Nazis actually learned much of their eugenics initially from the US. Some of these eugenic health care policies were developed in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. These U.S. policies were emulated by Germany and incorporated into the governing philosophy of applied biology. There were laws on the book in Virginia that said that you could sterilize people. Um, and the Nazis took their 1933 sterilization law and mimicked it after the U.S. law. Yeah, in fact, there was a time in which there were letters uh, in U.S. journals saying, look at the Nazis have gotten ahead of us. We've got to catch up. And so, of course, when Hitler came along with his racial theories, he realized that this eugenics was a really good idea and he manipulated it to fit his racial theories, all mixed in with the Jews, the Gypsies, everybody else who was considered uh, racially inferior. All of this would lead to an appalling era in world history called the Holocaust, a period of persecution and mass murder. The Holocaust has been defined as the 12-year period from Hitler's rise to power in 1933 until the end of the war, 1945. It was a government planned, government supported mass extermination or mass killing and uh, while it was targeted towards Jewish people, there were many other groups of individuals that suffered during the Holocaust. Nazi doctors sterilized citizens against their will, euthanized 200,000 disabled German children and adults, and created the gas chambers and crematoria that were used for the mass murder of six million Jews, Poles, and Gypsies. Without the full support of physicians, scientists, and nurses, the Holocaust, as it unfolded, could never have happened. In the U.S., there were laws that could require that people be sterilized against their will. Sterilization laws were widespread in the U.S., most notably in Indiana and North Carolina. But other states, including California and Virginia, allowed sterilization even into the 1970s, in fact, in the early 20th century, the U.S. led the world in compulsory sterilizations. A very famous law was passed in Virginia that said it was okay to sterilize the retarded. And it was brought before the Supreme Court, and Oliver Wendell Holmes said three generations of imbeciles is enough, saying that it was okay to sterilize. While in Germany it became the leading ideology, then it was implemented into action. Hitler promised the German people they were creating the master race. I think the master race would have been uh, the Nazis' view of a strong, um, blonde, blue-eyed, healthy person who had no genetic defects and who was pure Aryan. So uh, a few more points on the history of eugenics in the United States. I want to... Uh, take a look at this video of uh, Charlie Follett. 1945, California's Sonoma State Home. Charlie Follett, a 14-year-old ward, is singing in a field when he's ordered inside. First they shot me with some kind of medicine. It's supposed to deaden the nerves. Then the next thing I just heard was snip, snip, and that was it. Did they tell you what they were doing to you? No. They didn't have to tell him. He knew. A sterilization by force. How did you know what it was? Well, 
because, see, there's been others in there that had it before me. The other boys at the home had warned him how much it would hurt. Well, when they done this side here, it seemed like they were pulling the whole insides out. The 1930s through the 1950s were the heyday of the eugenics movement in the United States. The goal? To rid the country of the feeble-minded, defectives. And it wasn't some fringe or secretive program. It was well known and paid for by the states where it was practiced. Entire families labeled shiftless, degenerates. 60,000 men and women, boys and girls, sterilized. Some living at home, others like Follett in state institutions. His parents were alcoholics and couldn't care for him and his sister. 32 states had eugenics programs, but California was in a league of its own. The Golden State sterilized 20,000 people, more than twice as many as the next state, Virginia, and a full third of the nation's total. It was led by California's elite, including, at the time, the president of Stanford University and the publisher of the Los Angeles Times. The efficiency of California's program didn't go unnoticed. In the 1930s, the Nazi party in Germany was so impressed it asked for advice and Californians leading the program were only too happy to help. So eugenicists in California sent this book to the Nazis? Yes, they did. So the Nazis used this book as a model for their sterilization program? Absolutely. Germany used California's program as its chief example that this was a working, successful policy. California, the leader in forced sterilizations, but decades later, not a leader in making amends to victims. A few hundred survivors are still alive by one scholar's estimate, but the state has offered no reparations. Follett's tried for years, but says he can't even get a politician to talk to him, not even his own state representative, who also refused an interview request from CNN. His friend, Rudy Banlison, a nursing student, shows me letters he's written to no avail on Follett's behalf. Do you think the state of California just wants to forget about this, forget it ever happened? Honestly, I think they're just waiting, I mean, I hate to sound so cynical, um, I think they're just waiting for the victims to die and forget this whole thing ever happened. Where does all this leave Follett? He's 82, recovering from lung cancer, and hoping justice will come before he dies. You know, Elizabeth, your reporting on this has been incredible because I really had no idea this was so widespread. 60,000 Americans forcibly sterilized. Do you know how many of those people are still alive? You know, it's not known because except in North Carolina, Anderson, people aren't really reaching out and trying to keep track of how many victims there are. So, for example, as we said in California, one scholar thinks there's a few hundred who are still alive, but no one really knows for sure. Uh, aside from that statement by the former Governor Gray Davis in California, have any other officials there acknowledged what happened? You know, Anderson, we have spent the past few weeks calling and emailing politicians in California, and the silence has been astonishing. Let's get into this term eugenics. Now, of course, I practice a mucus diet healing system by Professor Arnold Arrett, and there is a discussion to be had about race and about eugenics within this context because Arrett uses the term. There's a lot of confusion about like, well, wait a minute. Some people just write off what he's saying immediately because he used that word. They don't know the history of that word. So I'm going to take a moment and read the note that I made in the uh, annotated, revised, and edited mucus diet healing system. This is uh, note 103 in this edition, the second edition of the mucus diet. The term eugenics was coined in 1883 along with the adjective eugenic by English scientist Francis Galton. It is an analogy of ethics, physics, etc. from Greek eugenes or well-born of good stock of noble race from you meaning good and genos meaning birth. The term is associated with a biosocial movement and philosophy advocating the improvement of human hereditary traits through promoting higher reproduction of more desired people and traits and reduced reproduction of less desired people and traits. Propagators tended to believe in the genetic superiority of Nordic, Germanic, and Anglo-Saxon peoples, supported strict immigration and anti-miscegenation laws, and supported forcible steril sterilization of poor, disabled, and immoral people. 
Eric uses the term eugenics to make a philosophical point about the potential for developing an improved race of humans through the mucus's diet healing system. For many modern readers, this term is off-putting due to its historic association with racist and genocidal policies. Of course, Eric wrote this text well before the climax of radical eugenic policies in the United States and by Adolf Hitler in Germany. Yet Eric's beliefs about a so-called superior race of people are diametrically opposed to the white supremacist mentality that was the foundation of most eugenic programs. Eric's proposition is that what we identify to be race, which is accepted today as a socially constructed belief system and not a biological fact by most scientists and academics, is a physical expression of the degree to which one's organism is overcome by mucus and toxemias. In other words, the darker you are, the more mucusless you are. This perspective is in line with scientific findings that reveal Homo sapiens to be a tropical frugivorous or fruit-eating species that has its origins in equatorial Africa. Eret is not using the term in a bigoted way insofar as he proudly speaks of his skin becoming darker while doing long fruit fast. On the other hand, he says that he noticed that his skin became lighter after eating even one piece of bread. Thus, from Eret's perspective, skin color is not based upon how close an organism lives to the equator or on the production of melanin, what Eret refers to as mineral salts, but is based primarily on the amount of uneliminated waste the body contains on the cellular level. In sum, Eret's use of the word eugenic is quite unique and different from many of his peers. Today, terms such as genetics, natural selection, evolution, etc. may be more politically correct labels to make the kind of points Eret is espousing. Essentially, it is a, quote, survival of the fittest argument, whereby the fittest humans are those that live in accordance with natural laws and eat a mucusless diet. 2017, the te uh, Tennessee judge issued an order offering inmates a 30-day sentence reduction if they underwent permanent birth control. So vasectomies for the men, four-year birth control implant for women, and of course this is coercion, human rights violation. But this is 2017, so we must understand that you know, sometimes when I make this kind of point, I feel as if I have to because in the United States of apathy, there is a lot of naivete, a lot of people that have been in privileged positions to be safe, to have access to all of the pus and mucus that they wanted to eat. They have... Uh, they don't realize how bad things are outside of their bubble. And so my, my effort is not to in any way shame them, but to say there's some studying that needs to take place so that we become fully formed citizens to be informed citizens. You've got to know this history. You got to know the history of slavery, know the history of the world wars and the Holocaust and the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. These things that I'm talking about, in my view, are all things that we need to know just to be a, if you want to consider yourself a world citizen. And if you're watching this, then you are partaking in the systems of society. So I don't want to hear like some people in the comments like to they, they kind of go off on the new age spiritualism uh path saying oh well, where this is it's it's just, it's all love and this is just all the illusion of society and you it's it's a very apathetic a very you know let things just do what they're going to do kind of thing I pr and i don't have a problem as we talked about in another video with the renunciant with with the the tradition of renouncing society but if you're watching this video you have not renounced society you are still partaking in the systems of society and if you are going to partake and you're going to be a part of this karma then that that apathetic 
attitude, in my opinion, is doing everybody a disservice because we have work to do. If you are going to leave society and go off on your mountain and meditate all day and sort of live this spiritual life, you have an, an advocate, you have a cheerleader, and you have a fan in me. But if you're going to stay here, I don't want to hear about that it's the Kali Yuga or it's, you know, you know no, like this is work that we need to do if we want to try and survive. And this is work that we owe to our ancestors who brought us to where we are, that we owe to ourselves and that we owe to our future children and future descendants. So we got to figure this out. As I'm going to say in a minute, I don't have all the answers. I don't have many of the answers. I have information about things that I think we should be taking a look at, talking about learning from, but we're going to have to come together and make, put some serious things in place. But coming together without knowing all of this, without understanding the historical context, without, it's a waste of time in my opinion. Just coming together just based on fear of, oh, I, I, my money's not coming in or fear of something that might happen, but you don't know what has happened in the past. It's problematic, and that's why so many efforts have failed over the years where people have tried to stage uprisings or overthrow uh, corrupt governments or change. Although there's so many of them that have failed, and even ones that seem to work in the short term, in the long term, failed because, well, because everybody's eating pus and mucus forming foods and so it's destined to eventually fail but quote programs like this aren't actually unusual the united states has a long history of forcibly sterilizing people and it never really stopped uh that uh, leah hunter who wrote uh wrote an article on this topic so a couple takeaways is don't underestimate the power of the government Respect, don't fear it, respect it, study it, understand it. I am not somebody said, oh, are you fear mongering? Are you? I am trying to say, let's take a look at some of these historical benchmarks that have been sanitized from most people's education. I didn't learn about any of this in high school, in junior high. Or college, I had to learn this stuff on my own. Some people are blessed to have either be homeschooled with very smart parents, uh, uh, or privately educated that might where they might include some of this information. But overall, most of the people I know have not been in the position to know this stuff. I started learning about this stuff in elementary school, but I did it on my own when I one of my first. Uh, really intense report uh, reports that I ever did was in sixth grade. I think it was sixth grade. It was either fifth grade or sixth grade. I think it was sixth grade. I wrote a report on Hitler and the Holocaust. And so uh, these things we're talking about today, I had been exposed to and understood them at the age of 11 and 12. So, and, and this is a presentation overall. This is something that this is high school level, junior high school level. You could, uh, you know, we're, we're not going too deep into anything where, in my opinion, where you would have to be uh, an adult or in a college age to really understand this, this kind of information. This, in my opinion, is accessible, should be accessible to a large group of people. And it's our responsibility to know this stuff so that we can protect ourselves from corrupt entities, groups of people, corrupt governments, uh, uh, groups of people that hate who we are, hate us. So now we come to the point of the relevancy of having this kind of discussion today, saying that if the government could force sterility, could they ever universally force vaccinations? So I'm putting this discussion here within this context so that 
we can understand there's, there's so many examples of this kind of, of the government overreach. Oftentimes when we talk about them, those of us that are keenly aware of these things happening uh, all the time, when we nor and normally when we talk about them, people, the average person sort of just, ah, eh, that's yeah, whatever. Oh, you're just, you know, you're just hyped up, you're whatever. But all of a sudden now, people are starting to become a little bit more aware because you have government agencies that are saying you can't leave your house, you're on house arrest curfew you need to be in by a certain time rolling up the road what what what's these tanks doing what's all these military vehicles doing in my town all of a sudden what is going on and those of us that have been consistently uh, uh, chiming the alarm all of a sudden some of the things that we're talking about don't seem as outlandish i try to put my my message within the context of history to show you that there's nothing new under the sun. This has happened before and it's going to ha- and it and it's going to happen again and in and unless we do something it's going to keep on going on. But what is often underestimated by corrupt pus-filled folks that wish to just dominate and control us and use us, the people is that through education, organization, mobilization, and implementation, we can protect ourselves. We can protect our freedom, our autonomy. And that is what I would like to talk about when we have our meeting, which is going to be this Wednesday. So I know if you're watching this video in the future, uh, we will already have had this meeting. But I am calling all brothers and sisters that's into practicing the mucus diet, or if you're in this realm, every for the past several weeks, every week we've been having a a, a get together, an online meetup, mucus free meetup. And in this week, we're just gonna put some time aside. We won't do it the whole time, maybe just 40 minutes or an hour or however long it goes, and we're gonna talk about uh, these issues. And talk about ways and strategize on ways that we can protect each other. Because we have to take this very seriously. So, the prospect of universal forced vaccination. Should we be concerned about universal forced vaccination? My answer is yes. Because everything is leading these decisions that the government's making. When... With what's going on right now, we have to be vigilant. We have to look at what laws and policies are being put into place. While there is a lot of fear, people are concerned about economic issues, their money, their family, their all of these things, people are more likely to not see something happen. That some, some kind of policy, more rights. Every time this happens, more rights are taken away. And we as the people, the only way for them to be taken away is we have to let them be taken away. And so I am saying that, yes, we should be concerned about this prospect of universal forced vaccination because anytime you're talking about forcing somebody to do something, whether it's forced sterilization, forced vaccination, any kind of forced operation, any sort of forced medical stuff. You are infringing on human rights. You're infringing on local, national, all kinds. of. There's all kinds of rights that are being infringed upon. But to know that, you have to know what are your rights. But what can we do about this? So my goal with this discussion is to just start the conversation. I'm not, like I said before, I'm not here to provide all the answers. Of course, my opinion is everybody should start practicing the mucus diet healing system, get on the transition, and I talk about that in a lot of other videos, but 
in this case, this is a place where we can unify even outside of mucus as diet practitioners because there's a lot of people, even people that believe in vaccinations that would be on our side saying that forcing people to vaccinate is not right. And so a coalition is going to have to eventually be put together so that we can uh, unify and fight fight back whether whether this happens in 2020 or if this is part of a transition and this doesn't happen until 2025, 2030, 2045 it, it it doesn't really matter but if we're awake and we're seeing what is happening seeing rights being taken away and what concerned me the most was how eager people are to give those rights away. That's what can that concerns me more than them trying to take it. That's what they do. That doesn't surprise me. Of course they're trying to take your rights away. Who doesn't know that? We should all know that. But the fact that so many people are so apathetic it can it just concerns me. It frustrates me, and we all we're, we're all here to do our part. We're all here to share a certain vibration and frequency. And so I is my viewpoint on it. I don't I don't take credit for you know everything that I'm that I'm sharing or the, these ideas or all that kind of stuff. I give credit to the spirit you know this uh, i'm being the the i'm i've what i've tried to do in my life is remove obstruction so that whatever wants to come through me is able to do so and so that's just to say that that's why i made this video that's why we're talking about this uh the, it, yes, it could be easy. There was a part of me that wanted to jump in my van. As soon as they said that you're not allowed to, you have to be locked in your house. Uh, and they gave the order. There's a, a part of me wants to leave all this behind, this whole charade. Because unlike a lot of people that say it, I, I, I could go off <laughs> into the wilderness and, and, and leave society behind and do that, that type of lifestyle, the life of the renunciate. But I'm answering a call. I've been called to do something that I don't see anybody else doing. Talk, talk about something in a way that I don't see other people doing. I have no interest in parroting what other people are saying. They're already saying it. I could just share their video with you and say, here, if you want to hear that. But nobody else is talking about this stuff in the way I, I know I'm talking about it. And so I've been called to do this because... Hopefully it helps somebody. Hopefully if it helps one person, if one person gets something out of this and is able to protect themselves from whatever's coming down the pike, then I feel like it's worth it. With that said, mucus free meetup discussion on this topic. It's going to go down this Wednesday. That's March 25th, 2020. Uh, to be a part of this, you have to be in the mucus free life insiders club you can hit the link below if you're not already on the mailing list, the Insider Club mailing list. Hit that link below. Subscribe. Uh, you'll also be, get notified if you are a part of the Mucus's Diet Healing System support group on Facebook. You can find us. Uh, but this is going down. So we're just we're going to come together. A couple things I'd like to talk about. How might forced vaccinations be implemented? Uh, I want us to create a list put our minds together and just, okay, what's all the different ways that they could conceivably execute that type of order? What local, state, federal, international, and human rights laws might this violate? So a little research can be done because we're going to have to deal with things from different angles. People are coming from different angles, Some depending on what state you're in, depending on what you identify your government to be. You know, we're going we to come together and understand uh, the, all these different dynamics that will affect uh, how we go about uh, protecting ourselves. 
uh, ways to fight forced and coerced vaccination. And uh, a couple examples that I just put up, you have the, the education, which is important. People need to be educated on the topic. Uh, courts is uh, w- what kind of things are, can be can or can't be done using a court's approach, using the law and, and lawyers, uh, physical resistance. What's that? What does that look like? What does does it work? Does it not work? What about you know what that the, these this is just a discussion. Oh, I'm just starting the conversation. He said I don't got the answers. Starting the conversation because I don't see good quality conversations on the topic really happening yet. And again, there's there's a little bit too much naivete that nothing like this can happen. Even though if you're a student of history, you know that it's happened again and again and again. The from slavery to the forced sterilization to the Holocaust to we could just make the list to all of the people in places where there are still policies in place for for sterilization. I mean, there's we we have to we have to grow up, and 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 it is a spiritual for again for I I always feel like I have to address that because it tends to be. Where I get pushed back from people is sort of the new age spiritualists because they want that uh, that's that kind of soft and cushy ignorance that like, like let's just ignore what's happening in the world as much as possible. To me, the real advanced spiritual person along that type of philosophy is going to be somebody that is able to because it, it's a part of. The human experience, society, so many people's experiences. A true spiritual master is somebody that is going to be able to take all of that in and not and have the vibration level stay high, not descend into fear or anxiety. To be able to take all of that in empathetically and not shut down. To me, that that is a spiritually advanced person, someone that can take all this stuff in and not let anger cloud their judgment to do stupid things. That is an advanced spiritual person. Someone that is that is advanced spiritually is not somebody that just ignores all these things, puts their head in the sand and just says, oh, and 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 hopes that they don't come for you that you don't have to that you're protected that you are in a privileged space where you can uh, a safe space where you don't think that they're going to come for you there were a lot of highly spiritual native people in the americas that were taken out by vicious pus-eating zombies that came over to their situation. There was a lot of highly spiritual African people that were killed or taken to a different land, stripped of their humanity. This is not new. These these things, the, this is not even extreme. This is not an extreme discussion. It's a historically based discussion and taking a just taking a look at these facts what happened and figuring out what is the best course forward for us so we stand the best chance and we got to understand again this is a for those that have been called you know this is this is a calling in my opinion uh when we talk about the uh, you know, or organizing, education, organization. So this meeting would represent the organi- organization. Starts off with a few people getting educated. Those few people come together and start to organize. Then, then you start to mobilize. See, a lot of people mobilize. Uh, when I say a lot of people, sort of revolutionaries in the past, have tried to mobilize people without an educational program 
just find something to to rally people around and, and use their anger and frustration to bring them together and then sort of control that group to their own ends and whatever. And that always generally ends in some type of catastrophe. But what I'm talking about is education. We get, get this information, really get un, understand this stuff. We come together and organize, put together a plan, then mobilize. And a big part of the mobilization process is an educational process. And then implement whatever the community comes up with in terms of a plan when the time is right, when it is necessary to then implement that plan, then the implementation takes place. So, uh, so finally we want to get a list of the best scholars on the topic, historians, lawyers, these, these different, the different entities that's on this topic, as well as a short list, not a huge list, but a short list of really good books that we could read, uh, that we can circulate. So we're all on the same page. That's part of the, the education and the organ organization part. Let's, let's get on the same page because everybody's coming from s with really different backgrounds with different philosophies, different spiritual, religious belief systems, different experiences in wherever they live, whatever country they're living in. So let's get, so that helps us get on the same page and we all kind of study some of the same things so that we can ha have a unified understanding of what is happening. So I'm going to wrap this up. I thank you for hanging in there with me on this one. And uh, I hope this was informative. I hope that you uh, enjoyed the discussion and uh, I urge you to come to, if, if you're see, watching this before the meeting Wednesday, I urge you to come uh, to our discussion and uh, be, a, be a part of this uh, transformation. This is a transition, uh, you know, transition, revolution, you know, to me, those words are, uh, uh, are akin in some ways. You know, this is a, a transitional moment uh, in in history, and so you're being called as I'm being called. You know, if you're getting this message, you're being called to act. You know, we we can't be naive to think that nothing's gonna happen. We can't just sit, but not on this one. You know, you'll notice I don't come out and talk about these things all the time. You know, in the past, there's some things that have happened. You know, over the past ten years and. People are, oh, you're going to make a video on that? Or like, people are freaking out about something. And I'm like, that's nothing. <laughs> there, there, there's, there, those are not important. It's going to blow over. You're not even going to remember this in a couple months. This is different. This is a different situation that we're in right now. And so I'm, I'm here answering my call. And I urge you to answer your call. Let's come together. Let's uh, educate each other. Let's support each other and let's protect each other from whatever is is coming going to be coming at us. And so with that, I thank you so much. And uh, if you would sh share this video, get this information out there uh, as, as wide as we can. And until next time, peace, love and breath.